Uh, first, we have Frederick uh, de Blesser, who is the author of Nodebox, uh, which hopefully you guys have seen before. And if not, don't look now because you'll be distracted. Um, he is currently pursuing his PhD in generative design at the Experimental Media Research Group at St. Lucas University College of Art and Design and is working on a browser-based version of Nodebox, which I believe we're going to get a glimpse of. Uh, and our second speaker, Tom DeSchmidt, the author of Pattern, a web mining module for the Python programming language. Tom finished his PhD in computer creativity at the Computational Linguistics and Psycholinguistics Research Group in the University of Antwerp, and now works at EMRG. And his current research interests include sentiment analysis and stylometry. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm Frederick, that's Tom, as uh, uh, was pointed out to us. And together we, we are the Experimental Media Research Group. Um, we're situated in Antwerp in Belgium, and we have a couple of focuses. We focus on computer graphics, uh, meaning data visualization, generative art, user interfaces, and artificial intelligence through data mining, machine learning, and creativity. Um, our target, oh sorry, that's us. Our target audience is a bit different, but I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, I'm currently pursuing a PhD about the impact of generative design tools. So uh, the guy from Lyra, come talk to me afterwards. Um, and uh, Tom is the, has um, got his PhD last year um, and also developed a pattern library, which I'll talk about. And then uh, Lucas Nice, we have to mention him. He couldn't be here uh, today, but he's the head of our research department. Um, today, what we want to talk about is show you a little bit of the tools that we're using for graphic designers, how we can do data mining through pattern. And then we also wanted to present a case study to, to sort of explain what the tools are doing. And then finally, um, show you a demo. And just to make sure that I'm not running over time, I'll have a stopwatch here. Um, so let's talk about Notebox. Um, Notebox is a free application that generates visuals by connecting nodes. That's the, the easiest uh, way to talk about it. So it's been through a couple of revisions. Um, the one that you see here is uh, version 3. And it's a cross-platform application, a desktop application, running on Mac, Windows, and Linux. Um, we use it a lot. Um, with students and through um, demonstrating it and, and uh, using it with students, we found out that it's actually really useful as a data visualization tool as well. Um, this didn't come from us, actually. This was a student who wanted to do a data visualization using the software, and we thought it was crazy. But it turns out that it was actually a really good match for the tool itself. So we started focusing on that. And we do a whole lot of workshops. Um, last year, I think we did four or five workshops um, all around the world, and we're open to do more, if you like, um, mostly for graphic design students. So I think our target audience is a bit different than um, other people, because we are focusing really on non-technical people. Um, here are some of the examples of work that students have created. This is the uh, uh, sort of standard visualization of the shipwrecks of California that were um, um, shipwrecked during a 50-year period. Um, you see some increase. They, they're <coughs> colored by um, the, the category or the way they, are, um, the way they crashed. Some vanished, um, which is interesting. Um, this is a really fun one. This is made by two students from Lithuania. And it focuses on the Eurovision Song, Fet Song Contest, which I'm not sure that all of you have heard about. Uh, <laughs> anyway, you should look it up. It's awesome. Uh, it's like the, the most camp thing coming out of Europe ever. Um, uh, but what's, what's really interesting for us is that the voting process is so predictable. Um, so you get a lot of countries that sort of vote for each other, not because the song is really good, but just because they're geographically located and they're friends, and so they want to stay friends. Um, and so we're from Belgium, so this is the, I highlight the part from Belgium. And you see that the, the votes actually are geographically together, which is kind of strange because it's not really about the quality. And then some, I see some other, uh, so close are Great Britain, France, um, the Netherlands, and then far away are Poland and uh, I don't know the, what the other ones are, but we don't care about them. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, this is another one that's uh, also created during the same workshop um, by uh, three students, well actually two students and uh, one who 
got coffee for the other ones. Um, he, uh, <laughs> they all got the same grades. It's kind of hard to separate them. Um, <laughs> so they, they focused on, uh, they took uh, the, uh, I can show you. They, they took uh, subtitle data from 50 years of film speech all through this um, subtitle information. So they took all the speech data um, from films, and then they, they visualized word usage over time. Uh, so they visualized what words like sir or tank or god would, would look like over time. Um, and uh, they overlaid it in Excel uh, just to see. And you see it's kind of messy. And the reason why it's messy is this is not the best way to represent it, obviously. Also because they didn't want to have the exact numbers. They just wanted to have more of a feel of what all these things would look like. And what they did was they, they opted for a small multiples approach. Um, and they took that into the software and they basically said, well, this is about speech. So let's create kind of a word shape, like a sound, uh, sound waveform, which they could do in Notebox. And then you would sort of distribute over time. And here you see a close up of words like, oh, OK. And then how, how dad and mom sort of move through time. And um, it's really interesting to see a difference in word, word usage. Um, some of the visualizations that I showed you now use a, I, I don't really have words for it. Maybe, maybe they exist and I just don't know them yet. Um, but I would call them graphs in the sense that they're like they use these typical uh, graphical shapes like dots and lines and things like that. Um, but often when we do these workshops, we have other students who want to do something else. Remember, these are graphic designers. And so they use a, a concept that I call glyphs. And a glyph is basically a parametric shape that they're able to tweak by changing the parameters, so feeding in data into the, parametric into the parametric shape. And the best way to show it is actually by showing you an example. And this is um, a project by a student from Finland who did a, um, a font called the Evil Font. And what's interesting about this is that the control surface actually has an evilness slider. Um, so this one is not one you, you find in Illustrator soon. And that's, that's really interesting. I'll come back to that later after I show the example. Um, so this is at zero evil. And then we sort of increase the slider. And you see we get a little bit of evil and get some barbed wire, some blood. And you get more and more evil. Some razor blades, um, eyes, all seeing eyes, and teeth, and then the eye here appearing. And so this is basically by controlling the evil slider, you would get this thing. So the, the thing itself is not, it's not built in, right? We don't have an, an evil note now, uh, or yet. Maybe we should. But uh, the interesting part is that the student was able to create it. So um, this is something that we focus on a lot. They, they can create their own functions or their own abstractions, basically, around the data that they want to do, and then link that to to a data set that they want to do. So other things might be people want to visualize productivity by using a monster or something. And so this is really interesting because it's sort of different from the other visualizations in that they're not using the strict graphical objects that we associate with data visualization, but more like an abstract thing. Um, and, and I think it's, for graphic designers, really interesting because they can work on their graphic um, aspects and make more cool razor blades. Um, um, we also see usage of notebooks in the generative art scene. And so there we use notebooks not for data visualization, but for something else, uh, which is the generative art, which is basically where, where we came from. Um, so this is a project called Spam Ghetto uh, by a um, design agency in Italy called Todo, um, who work for people like Lavazza and Fiat. And what they did is they created a wallpaper based on spam. So they, um, they took um, their spam folder and they made these uh, visualizations that showed headlines of all the spam sort of flowing through it. And it's a wallpaper, so you can, um, you can order it online. Even better, you can send them their, your, your own spam and they will create a custom uh, version <laughs> with your own spam. So it's useful for something, at least. Um, so I'll uh, give the word to Tom now, who will talk about um, pattern and data mining. So thank you, Frederick. Um, the examples that Frederick showed all have something in common. They're all based on data, obviously. Um, 
and there is a big and cool data set that is interesting to us, which is called the internet. Now, the problem with the internet is that the data is all unstructured. You don't get a CSV file or an Excel sheet. You get different languages, different dialects. You get facts, fiction, opinions, all mingled through each other. So how do you get this unstructured data into structured information? So from natural language to a table that you can then visualize. Um, the technique that you use is called text mining. And I want to give you a very short introduction to text mining and how we are using it to visualize stuff. So we have a, a Python toolkit called Pattern. Um, it's documented online, it's free for commercial use, so you can do whatever you want with it. Um, and it has a range of tools. You have some tools for data mining, for getting content from Google, uh, tweets, Facebook sites, Wikipedia pages, and so on. You have um, functionality for text analysis, um, for example, part of speech tagging, which is a, a syntactical an analysis. It gives you um, information about word types. So is it a verb? Is it a noun? Uh, is it a noun phrase? Is, is it a collection of verbs? Um, or you can use it to do sentiment analysis, so finding out if um, an opinion is positive or negative. Um, there are machine learning tools, so support vector machines, um, vector space models, neural networks, and so on. But I'm not going to go into that. Um, one short example of, of how you would use it. Suppose you were um, mining tweets from Twitter, and you get a tweet, my new iPhone is amazing. You could use part of speech tagging in pattern to find out the different word types. You could look at the adjectives, and you could um, deduct from the adjective if this is a positive or a negative opinion. Because, oh, I'm going to start uh, with a small example first. So the code is really simple. Um, you have a Twitter class. Uh, you have a parts tree command. In this rule, I'm creating a Twitter object for English language, and I'm searching it for tweets that have the word phone in it. So I get a list of tweets. And then for each uh, text in each tweet, I'm parsing it. So parsing does part of speech tagging. So what I get is a list of sentences. In each sentence, there are chunks, so words that go together. Uh, the black cat is one chunk. The, the words all belong together. Um, and inside each chunk, you have words. Words have a type because they are parsed. In this example, uh, JJ is the, the abbreviation for adjective. So I can uh, filter the adjectives out of each tweet. And I can print them. And then you get a collection of adjectives that are used when people talk about phones. Now, adjectives are interesting because um, we use them to convey our personal emotions. For example, we say a very good phone, um, a bad phone, an awesome conference, a horrible talk. Um, so adjectives and adverbs tell us something of our personal feelings. And using this technique, just looking at adjectives and assigning scores to them from plus one to minus one, you get pretty good accuracy for determining um, if somebody is saying something positive or negative. Um, the only drawback is that it doesn't work for sarcasm. So if somebody says, nice try, Obama, nice has a positive feel to it, but the expression as a whole is <coughs> negative. Um, another code example, so I have a Twitter class. I have a sentiment command. In a loop, I'm um, searching for uh, English tweets that have the word Obama in it. And for each tweet, I'm printing the text of it. And I'm printing some uh, sentiment values out of it. So what you get is a list of the tweet. And below are some numbers that represent if the tweet is positive or negative. So now, basically, we went from a natural language sentence to um, a numerical value that we can use in a visualization. Um, to summarize this, what is text mining? Text mining is um, big data mining. So you mine data from Wikipedia. Uh, Google, Twitter, or somewhere else. And you do real-time text analysis on that data. So you convert text to numbers. Um, to show one case study, um, we have a dashboard online that tracks what people uh, say on Twitter about Belgian politicians. So we have the amount of tweets per political party. We have the sentiment uh, per political party. We have politicians per city. We have the top politicians. Uh, we have timelines on sentiment. And uh, I think it was the 2010 elections. We were able to predict the outcome of the elections uh, two weeks in advance before the official results were in, just by looking what people online were saying about uh, politicians. Um, another case study is um, 
we looked at news articles. So all the Belgian newspapers, I think in a three year period, um, what was the amount of positive news articles or negative news articles about political parties? And what you see, the, the yellow orange um, lines are the right wing parties. The dark part of the bar is negative feedback. And you see that Belgian newspapers consistently um, report more negatively on right wing political parties. So it doesn't matter if you're left wing or right wing, that doesn't seem entirely fair. So this was a big thing um, in the media when we published these results. Um, what we're doing right now is uh, new research, it's text profiling. So what text pro profiling does is you want to get some information about the author, uh, what the author is, not what he's writing about, but based on the way he writes, you can derive information about age, gender, uh, the region the person lives in, personality, education, and so on. To show you some examples, um, Teenagers are more inclined to use informal language use, so chat language, smileys, curses. Uh, adults use more formal language. Um, women are inclined to use more pronouns, we, she, her, my, in a social context, so they talk about people. Um, I'm, I'm generalizing, of course. Um, uh, men use more determiners and quantifiers in a practical context. Uh, they talk about uh, figures, they talk about objects more than women do. Um, People with an extroverted personality will probably say, we think it's awesome. People with an introverted personality will say, I'm not so sure. So it's we versus I, positive language versus negative language. So let's try out a, a simple case study. We looked at um, what people um, comment on different um, US cable news companies. So we looked at uh, Facebook posts and tweets that mentioned CNN, MSN, uh, MSNBC, or Fox News. Um, and the idea is we gather the data, we use pattern to do sentiment analysis to try and find the gender of the person that posted um, a comment and uh, try to determine the writing level, so the complexity of language use, and use this um, data to visualize a graph in notebooks. Uh, we have about 130 thousand statuses from Facebook, most of them from Fox News. We have very little data from CNN, so there's probably a little bias in the data there. We have about 13,000 tweets evenly distributed among, among CNN, MSNBC, and Fox News. So some results, you get um, the percentage of male versus female, you get the amount of negative um, comments, you get the amount of root comments, and root comments means um, comments that are very negative, so that contain swear words or that are really very negative. And you get uh, an, in an indication of cruelty. Cruelty are people that like root comments. Um, <laughs> so it's not that spectacular. The, the only thing that is a bit strange is that you have a very high percentage of males uh, that comment on CNN, but it might be the bias that we have very little data for that. Um, in general, men are uh, slightly more negative than women. Um, and then another experiment is when you look at uh, writing level. So writing level of 100 would be um, the cat with the hat, so children's books. A writing level of 30 would be a PhD thesis. Mm -hmm. And you see that there's some difference between CNN, MSNBC, and Fox News. Now, what is interesting that even though very few women comment on CNN, they are the ones that use the most sophisticated language. And well, I'm not going to draw any conclusions for that because again, it can be the bias in the data. Um, for Twitter, uh, there's some there's more negative feedback on MSNBC. There's a little bit of rudeness, but it's the same for everyone. And you see some um, difference in the topics that they cover, but hopefully that will be more clear in the visualization that Frederick shows. So I'm going to give the word back to Frederick. Thanks. Um, let's talk about visualizing the data. So uh, what I didn't mention in the in the beginning when I was showing student work is that a lot of the work is actually created um, in one week workshops. Actually all of the examples are created during one week um, by students who have never used the software before, who can't program, they're graphic designers, um, and who um, basically have to learn the software in two days 
make a, find a data set, make a visualization, um, and then finally in, on Friday, print it so they don't even have the Friday to, to actually do something useful there. So it's really a, a really short time, and, and based on that, I think it's really impressive. So I don't have a full week to show you how that might look in a visualization, but I'll show you what I can do in five minutes or something. So we use um, process that's or we, we, we give this to student as a process that's based on the visualizing data book. Who here is familiar with this book? I think a lot of people, yeah, awesome, awesome book. So uh, this talks about processing, but actually the, the system he uses is um, applicable to any kind of visualization process. Um, it, and I should mention, just as Mike mentioned and, and other people as well, um, that this looks very linear. In reality, this is not the case, but you probably all know that. Um, but let's think that it is, and let's talk you through the, all of the steps. So um, let's take the three first steps, acquire, parse, filter. And what's going on there is that we um, basically find a way to get the data into the system. Um, acquiring we do through um, the APIs that everybody's using, or we might find open data sets, open data sets, uh, which is awesome from World Bank or from data.gov. Uh, we parse them and we filter them, and a lot of the stuff hit there is stuff that we can reuse from pattern.web. So um, pattern has a really good uh, web component that allows us to access a lot of these data programmatically instead of doing it manually. Um, and the next step, and this is optional in some cases, um, is that we mine the data. And there we use um, the, what Tom talked about, which is the sentiment analysis module, which I'll also uh, show you in a minute. And then comes the, the last steps, and those are really where Notebox takes over. So at a certain point, we have a data set, it's clean, and then we can take it into the software, uh, represent it, refine and interact. And I should stress on this that Notebox really works best with clean data sets, so it doesn't work as well if you have something that's still messy and you have to clean up. That's really horrible to work with in Notebox, and I think everywhere. Um, so I want to show you uh, a short demo of how that might look in the system. And this is a video, and I hope it plays. I think I have to do something like this. Okay, there we go. So first off, we uh, import the data set. We can see here that it says, maybe you can't see it, fb-msnbc. So this is the Facebook data from MSNBC that Tom um, got. Um, there we can scroll through the data. And the first thing that we want to do is we want to show this on a timeline. So what we're going to do is we're going to take out the date. So basically, you can look at this data set as a tabular data set. And so what we are going to do is look up on the date. And this gives us, basically, extracts one column out of the data. So this is just a date column. Now, this is just numbers. Or we can't really do anything with them. So what we're going to do is we're going to um, put them on some kind of timeline. And to do that, we use a time scale, which is similar to what D3 uses, uh, where we can set a minimum and maximum date and then output values that are going to be coordinates. Um, we can use absolute values, or we can use things like two weeks ago, so it can parse some natural language or from two weeks ago to now or the other way around. Um, and then to apply that, what we're going to do is we're going to convert um, our incoming data using the scale that we provide. So if we click on that, now we see that these dates are converted to coordinates. So now we have coordinates that we can use, and we can attach them to a node called make point that takes two inputs, an x and a y coordinate. And so if we map them to x, we see that they uh, go in the horizontal direction. If we map them to y, we see that they map in the vertical direction. Makes sense, right? So we map them to x, and this is our timeline. And already, uh, we're going to use, because these are just abstract values, these are points. We want to map them on ellipses, so we're going to change um, the ellipse, make them a bit smaller so you can actually see. And you sort of see day and night patterns already in the data occurring. It's really subtle, but it's like an emergent property of the data that people are not really talking as much at night. So next part is that we want to visualize on the y-axis the sentiment values. And so we um, get that from the, uh, from the data, or we do the analysis, and then we attach it to y. And you see that there's only a tiny, tiny little bit of change. And that's because if we look at the data, then we see that these are actually numbers going from minus 0 to, z to 1. So they're a bit too small. So we have to do some kind of uh, conversion. There's many ways to do that in the system. But right now, we'll just use multiply, which will multiply with a constant value. Um, 
So we're going to pipe that into make point, so put the node in between, and then we can just interactively drag this up and we see the sentiment value spread out, um, as it were. So that gives us the sentiment value. Um, because we're graphic designers, we can do we can change all the properties um, like color uh, these things. This happens in a separate node. Um, so this is a, a separate step that we can also parameterize if we like. Um, and then we can add a legend. The legend is going to be based on the scale, so we attach it to the scale. And then if we uh, render this, so if we uh, look at the output here, we see the scale appearing. Now we can only see one thing at the time, so if we want to see both the points and the other and the legend, we have to use a merge node. And um, by connecting the two together, we can see that they're overlap. Now they're on top of each other, so go back to the legend, and then we can just drag the position down um, to actually change the legend. We can't drag it left to right because it's attached, so just left uh, that way. And then we can tweak the color as well if we like, so make it a bit more gray. Uh, and so this is our basic, super basic visualization that we got, where we get the sentiment values over time. Um, now what's interesting is that we can use this in, um, or we can embed this into another context. And to do that, what we're going to do is we're basically going to just make the visualization a bit smaller so it will fit in a different context. So we make it a bit smaller, we change the number of ticks so that we don't get as many points as we want. And then we can press the embed button and this gives us an iframe code just like YouTube. So we can take this uh, piece and we can copy and paste it somewhere else. We set the size so it fits in what we're doing. And then we can basically just paste this into our text editor, save. And this is, imagine that I'm working on a social media dashboard. This is what the dashboard looks like right now. And if we refresh, we get the visualization that we just entered. So it's really simple to just embed it inside of the other context. And I see there's something wrong. I don't see the legend at the bottom. It's because it's a bit too high. So we can just go back. Um, we can uh, adjust the size of the legend. That also means that we probably want to adjust the multiplication as well. So we can do that. And then we just go back to the other page, refresh, and uh, we just see the visualization um, as it should be. So it's all live. Um, What's interesting is that the data set itself is a, is a parameter. And so that means that, and this is kind of hard to see, but that means that if we, um, if we put in another data set value, so another file that we have provided, then we can just um, interactively make new ones, so make them parametric. And so we get the same data for Fox News and CNN. And we see that for CNN, we only have very little data just for one day. Um, here are some other visualizations. So there's a word cloud. There's gender distribution, also based on the sentiment analysis or the, um, um, the pattern library. So quickly to show you the word cloud, what we do is we um, sample the data because we don't want to see all of it. We extract the keywords. We extract the number of upvotes. We make these into text. And then we use a node called Nudge that will uh, basically make a word cloud that will just spread things out um, to the side. Um, it's a bit of an experimental one. Uh, male, female is even easier. We just import the data again. We group by gender, and then we just turn that into a pie chart. And we can make it bit bigger and smaller, if we like. So that's the basics of how you do a visualization in Notebox. <laughs> now, what's interesting, this is, this is cool for things like social media, but a lot of the data that, that we work with, and again, we're working with students, is that they, they're not really interested in this kind of data, or not only interested in this kind of data. They're interested in all kinds of data, and everything is data, like uh, music is data, and, and, or they might want to play with uh, sound waves, or uh, they might want to play with images and do something with that. So uh, there's a whole lot of stuff that I can see, and I'll point you to some of the websites that, that show you more stuff that our students have created. Um, but one fun example that I want to show you is where we um, use an image, basically, as a data set. So here we go back into the system. Um, and what we can see is that this is a bit more complicated. But we take in a uh, basic image, and we extract the colors from it. And so this is a beautiful sunset. So we can make it more detailed. But this is still the web, so we have to make it a bit bigger in this case. Um, until Chrome gets even faster. So, and then we can extract hue saturation value out of these, convert these values into values that we like, and then use a make point again to redistribute them. And if this is attached, if we attach this to animation, which we can do, um, then we can play this and it will automatically sort of redistribute the pixels according um, to the image. 
So the bright, uh, the dark ones go at the bottom and the bright ones go at the top. And you also see the, the hue spread. Now, because hue is often visualized as a circle, uh, what we want to do is use a, a different node that's called coordinates that maps these onto uh, a radial uh, wave. And so now you see, you see the hue circle uh, of this image appearing. And it's kind of slow because, it, because of the screen recording, but it actually, um, actually works really well with thousands of points. So. And then, it, because it's live, we can just keep playing with it. So here, we can just change um, how big the size of the, the outer circle is going to be, for example, just by changing it. And then here, we can see the non-animated version, so just the coordinates mapped onto the pixels. And of course, we can change it as well. So that's um, another visualization that we did in the system. So, um, when we when we started out notebooks, and that was in 2004, I think we it was a really different um, environment. We we had web browsers, but basically, if you wanted to make something interactive, you would use Micromedia Director, which was mm. awesome. Um, but it's no longer supported high year. Um, so we had we had completely different tools and tool sets. And basically, everything on the web is slow. And then if you want to do something fast, fast in that day, then you would just do it on the desktop. So we, we started out just creating these desktop tools. But as we got along, we noticed that browsers became faster. And we could do more and more of this stuff. And so we were facing this choice of what are we going to do. And in, in September last year, I bit, the bullet, I bit the bullet. And I said, OK, let's just do everything on the web. And so I um, created Notebox Mac, and Mac is make in Dutch. And uh, it's a version of Notebox that runs entirely on the web. So that means that all of the nodes now run online. Um, we can run them either uh, in the browser on the server side, in Node.js. Um, and uh, the whole system is basically a, a live IDE, a live visualization tool uh, that we can run online. Um, Mac will be um, open source, but at the moment, uh, you can still already sign up for the um, beta release. That will come out soon. Um, what I didn't talk about and I in, uh, at the, this slide at the last moment, because I, it's, I'm so used to it, is that there's actually two modes of working. There's the visual way, but what's also important is that there's also the code way. So um, you can choose. Basically, when you create a new uh, what we call function, um, which is the main abstraction in the system, you can choose whether that's going to be a visual function or one that's written in JavaScript. And so they, they both use the same interface, meaning they have multiple uh, inputs and one output. And so it doesn't really matter if you use a visual one or one that's written by code, because you can just uh, mix and match the two. So the, the ones using nodes can use ones written in code and the other way around. Um, that also means that it's completely transparent what you're doing. So at every point, you can do view source and look at what, what this thing is going to be, what it's built out of. And if that's built out of other components, you can sort of dig all the way down to see what the primitives are. And um, the idea is that you, you'll be able to clone them and make, make your own versions and change them. Um, so that's really key to us, because um, we believe a visual approach works really well, but at some point, um, especially with the model that we are using, people will probably grow out of it, or they want to do some things um, themselves. And there we have to have a possibility to use code as well. Um, a little bit about the, the way that the whole system is set up. So uh, we are part of an, um, an academy. And as part of the job of the academy is to distribute um, tools for the greater community. And so both Pattern and Mac are free and open source. Uh, we had some report bugs and contribute code there, so feel free to cooperate. And then there are some um, commercial services that we're doing. So Tom is in the process of um, commercializing um, the stuff that he's shown with text profiling. And for Mark, what we're going to do is basically allow um, uh, the people using, using it for open projects to be open. And then if they want to use it for private projects, we um, you will pay a small fee for basically for the hosting and for getting our servers online. And that's the same model that GitHub uses somehow. Um, because a lot of these uh, talks talk about the positive aspects, and I did that too. And I, I, I also like talking a little bit about the challenges we still face, about the things that are not going the way uh, as we plan. 
Um, I just got back from Lithuania doing a workshop, and one thing that I noticed is that um, the students are self-reliant once they get to the notebook side, but the first parts, the acquire phase, the parsing, the filtering, the mining, still requires a lot of intervention. And so there, at some point, we have to find a way as a community to make people that are non-technical programmers to be self-reliant, to be able to get data in a flexible way. And maybe people here can point me out to tools that I'm still missing, but I haven't found like the perfect tool uh, for people to be able to confidently give them to that. We, we go use Google Refine and that sort of works, but apart from that, there might be much more that we can do. Um, Another aspect that, that we think is interesting, because we, again, come from a graphic design background, is, is typography. Um, one of the things that powered the evil font uh, visualization that I showed in the beginning is that it has access to the, to the raw shapes of the letters, because it has to. It has to apply uh, these points and change them. And so um, I looked around, and there wasn't really something available that allowed us to do that. There's no API on the web to do that. And there wasn't really a library to do it as well. So that was a big challenge for us, because we could say, OK, well, let's give up and let's not do that at all. Or we could do something else. And that's what we did. So I created a library called opentype.js, which does the hard, tedious, and insane job of parsing a true type and PostScript typeface um, just by re literally looking at the binary data structures and examining it. And so. Um, it, it takes these, the, the whole typeface and it allows you raw access to all of the elements. And I can show you a little demo of how that looks. So uh, this, is the, um, uh, this is the demo site that you can visit if you go to the website. Um, and here you see the letter shapes. You can choose a file. So you can use any kind of typeface that we want. We support almost all of them. I haven't tried all letter fonts in the world, but a lot. We can view the metrics. Of course, and then we can start playing around with it because we have access to the letter shapes. We can do things like snap these to a virtual grid, for example, uh, which is just some, uh, it's, it's also a note that's inside of Notebox, um, but it's here we just extracted it just to show you how, how fun it is to basically create your own typefaces in a really easy way. And this uses any kind of typeface, so any kind of typeface will look different. And you get access to all the letters. Unicode is supported, um, we support kerning. And we had some recent con contributions um, from people who created an inspector, which allows us to do kind of like the web developer tools in Chrome, but then for fonts on the web. So this was a, an external contribution, contribution, and it's awesome. But um, again, I think it's a really um, useful uh, tool, and we, we already see a lot of people using it commercially. Um, we recently had a Kickstarter funded that used OpenTypeJS for, uh, for doing font uh, design. Um, Lastly, uh, what I want to do is uh, I just want to make a short conclusion because um, what I found fascinating is that this whole data visualization scene is not just for experts like us. This is, this is really for, uh, or it can be really opened up for any kind of people. We saw this with the, the tools from Lyra and hopefully with the, the tools that we are writing as well. Um, I'm constantly amazed at the kind of things that my students can do in, in one week by basically starting from scratch. And so I think if, if they can apply that, um, that knowledge in one week, I think we have a whole lot more people that can apply this and make it useful uh, for other people as well. So um, that's it for us. Thanks.